Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on causality. Today we talk about two papers. One recent work from Julia Pearl and his PhD student, or I think maybe postdoc, I think by now he's Professor Bareinboim. And then also something about fair machine learning very briefly as the final topic. So um, there are a couple of papers we look at today, mostly at the first one, causal inference and the data fusion problem, which is some PNAS paper from 2016. I think I have it here. So this is some paper you can also download from online. So I think it's really accessible. And I just show you possible directions, what you can do with causality and how this goes on maybe beyond this topics that we had so far in the lecture. Um, another interesting topic is also fairness, which is about machine learning methods, which try to violate, uh, which try to avoid like some, uh, some unfairness. Okay, that's just to say, so we want to avoid discrimination, for example, in machine learning. For example, if there's a machine learning algorithm that makes decisions about credit assignment and that maybe that has a bias that males get the credit and females don't get the credit or something and we want to dis discuss it or racial bias or whatever biases there might be. And so how can we possibly quantify it and maybe what can we do about it? And I will just give hints, maybe two papers and introduce the problem very briefly. There's quite a bit of work about that one. So we have these four topics. We talk about transportation, missing data, selection bias, and a bit about fair machine learning today. So let's start with this paper from Elias Bareinboim and Julia Pearl from 2016. And that is quite a nice paper. Let me first give you an overview maybe with this picture. So there might be different situations. So one situation might be we have some data set from observational studies. So we observe variables x, y, and z. And we have a certain query. And we discussed already this query then often is something like p of y given do x with some do operator in there. And the question is whether we can calculate these probabilities only from these observational studies. So that's one question. And that's typically done with do calculus. You can sometimes derive a formula given that you have a graph. And then you can say, yes, this query can be answered. It's identifiable. Or it cannot be answered if it's not identifiable. And the problem often here is the problem of confounding, that there's a confounding variable, and somehow we need to control the backdoor path. So that's kind of going from 1 to cube. So that's like the first story. The second story is that we also have some experimental studies. So we have some probability distributions of the form p of some variables, given that we have changed the values actively with some randomized tests or something. So we have some p of v given do of that. And that might be not exactly our query that we want to answer, but something similar or something related. And possibly we learn from it enough to answer our query. I, OK, nice that there are more people coming in. That's great. Um, and then there's the third version where we have selection bias data, where unfortunately we don't get really a sample of the true distribution, but we only have data from a situation where there's some variable which is for certain values of a variable we have data and if this value s is equal to zero we never have data and that can for example happen if you have questionnaires where you ask for income or something then maybe there's a bias that people with lower income they report it and people with higher income they don't report it and now let's say you want to evaluate some policy and see whether a certain policy change a certain do x has an influence on the income of people then the problem might be that the questionnaires that you get back only are those maybe with the lower income. And then it's unclear whether you can infer something from it. So that's the selection bias data. And we will also talk about that one today, how this could be modeled or how, could this, how we can think about this situation. And then there are also some theorems um, under what conditions can we also infer a certain query if we have only selection bias data. Then there's the fourth version where we have observational data and maybe also some experiments, but from some dissimilar population. So suppose you are, have some data from one hospital and those are all quite old people. And then you want to transfer this information onto a hospital where there are younger people. So some of the distributions are different, but some mechanisms might be the same. And so the question is, how can we transport data from or in, insights from one side with certain distributions 
to our query, which might be on a different side. So those are the problems we will look at today. So basically, the first one we covered already, like if we have observational data, we have the do calculus and to derive queries with the do operator in here. So this is interesting. So this is having partial some information from certain experiments, but not exactly the ones that we want. And also in that case, we can use do calculus and derive some formula for our queries. This one is more challenging in a way, but again, we will use do calculus and the typical reasoning to derive the right expression. So once we are able to write it nicely up with if having such a bias, what it means and what can be done about it, then we possibly also can get an expression like that one. And finally, the transportability problem is where we have certain things are the same in our graph, but certain distributions are completely different. And then what can we do about it? Good. The main tool will be the do calculus, as I said, and those are the three rules that we have seen before. And I think those are simplified versions. I think there's usually even yet another variable. Oh, no, this is already the general one. Those are the three rules of the general version. So there's one general conditioning called W in this case that is always there in all these distributions, and so also in the deseparation questions, they are there. And then we have like uh, adding an observation, Z, that, that's the first rule, but having some condition on do X, that's like the first rule. The second rule is about changing a condition into a condition that has the form do of Z. And the last one is about omitting a condition of the form do of Z. And I think we went to these different conditions where we have to consider these different graphs. So basically these graphs now mean, okay, if I have a condition on do X on both sides, then I need to consider the graph where I cut all incoming edges to the x, and the rest is then the same. And there are some subtleties with changing a z to a do z, then we have to look at a certain graph z where we chop off the outgoing edges, and then if I want to omit a do z, it's even more complicated. I need this z of w, which is like a certain special set, and we had some discussion on why this might be necessary or not. So let's start with identification through auxiliary um, experiments. So that's basically like the second branch here. So two, we have data from experimental studies and we have observational data. And sometimes we can combine this knowledge to have our query covered. Um, here I refer basically to this um, overview paper from 2016, but those are two other papers where they are discussing exactly these questions. So this is also has been researched for over 20 years they call it here surrogate experiment, where surrogate means not exactly the experiment that you want to do, but some other experiment, and how can it be combined? So here's an example. That's a graph. So the graph is basically having variables on cholesterol level, on heart disease, and that might be a certain diet. And in principle now, maybe a scientific question might be, so what is the probability that I have a risk for a heart disease? given that I have a high cholesterol level. And that might be an interesting question to answer because then we could just have patients and increase the cholesterol level by some medication. And that then will help us maybe with having a lower heart disease rate or a higher one, depending on how the cholesterol level is set up. So, however, it might not be um, ethical to really make experiments with humans by setting the cholesterol level up or down. It would be much nicer if I just have like a random population and I know something about them and some of them might do a diet eating certain things or avoiding certain things and that might be a variable that I can control and my assumption is it will control the cholesterol level but possibly of course also the heart disease rate. Now of course we cannot directly now use this P of Y given do Z to order, uh, in order to, uh, to estimate the P of Y given do X but possibly by using do calculus, we can derive a formula for that. So something we could get from a questionnaire from a random population would be the joint distribution of the variable. And possibly we can also have an experimentation where we have some people, they say, OK, now you stop eating X, please do that for three weeks. And then we measure certain variables or something. And others don't do it. So that might be ethically OK to do such an experiment. But maybe forcefully changing the cholesterol level might not be a good idea. So let's see what we can do, whether we have some identifiability here. And as always, it depends on the graph that you consider. And those are four different situations. And in these four different situations, hello. In these four different situations, 
we have different outcomes. So sometimes we can do it. So in A, we can do it. In C, I think it's possible. Oh, in C, it's not possible. In B, I think it's possible as well. And in D, again, I'm not sure. So let's look at the first case. So let's look at graph number A. So this is the first graph here. And now we just apply do calculus and we start with p of y given do x. And at the end, we end up with a formula that only involves the do operator applied to z. Yeah, so that's a nice outcome. So we want to know something about how x is influencing the y if I intervene on x, but I don't have direct data observations. Oh, I have observations, but I don't have really experiments for that one. I only have experiments for z. And curiously, sometimes we can derive a formula like this. So let's go through the steps. So the first step here is that we introduce a do z, and that can be done with the third rule from the, from the do calculus. And for, to apply it, we need to check whether y and z are independent in this special graph here. And for that one, if a is our graph, that basically means we need to chop off the incoming edges of x, so those two edges are gone, so no incoming confounding, and the direct connection from z to x is also cut, and we need to chop the incoming edges for z, which is also a possible confounder with y. And in that situation, y and z are independent, okay? And for that reason, I can just put the do z here. Also, intuitively, it makes sense. If I manipulate the z, yeah, there's no direct link to the y because this is like a common confounder. It's a double-edged error. It doesn't mean that there's an error from z to y or the other way around, but it means there's some other variable. And so, basically, if I manipulate the z, there's no directed pass like through the back door from z to y that would influence the y. So that makes sense. And since I'm also observing the or setting the x in this case um, with the do x, there's also no direct influence if I manipulate the z via the x because the x is manipulated itself. So for that reason, I can add here the do z. And once that I have the do z included here, now. Um, I can apply rule number two, and I can change the do x to an x, and that is the essential step. So by including the do z, suddenly now I can just rewrite the do x into an x, and that's because, again, I need to check certain independencies. And the independency to check here is chop off the outgoing edges of x, which is the, x, the direction, uh, the edge from x to y, and then check whether y and x are independent in this manipulated graph. And they wouldn't be independent um, if the z wouldn't be observed or manipulated. Then there would be incoming edges into z, and the x might have a connection through a backdoor. But since I'm having the do z over here, also that connection via the z is kind of chopped off. And so they are independent. So I can change the do into an usual x. Okay, And that is now nice, because basically I got rid of the do x, and I included a do z. And this now lets me rewrite just by using the definition of the conditional distribution, um, just the joint divided by the marginal one. And those are now all things that I can possibly observe in my situation. Okay, so that is an example where this is possible. So far, so good? Yeah, so far, so good. Um, more generally, it can be also defined as a theorem, and it could be exactly defined when such a do z can be done and why not? And this is called z identifiability. And there's a paper from Bareinbaum from 2012 where he formulates conditions. And so the first condition is that x must intercept all directed paths from z to y, okay, which is the case in the first diagram. And then the probability of y given do x must be identifiable in the special graph where I um, cut all incoming connections to z. Okay, in that one, it must be identifiable for whatever reason, for backdoor, for front door, or for whatever thing. So if I have this identifiability of y given do of x in this special graph, then I somehow can also use these auxiliary experiments where I manipulate the z. Okay, and um, those two conditions are satisfied in A, as I just said, but for example, not in z, uh, not in C. So in C, the second condition is not um, fulfilled because I have this unknown confounder from x to y. Okay, so for that reason, the second condition is not fulfilled. 
So in D, for example, D is not fulfilled, as in the graph D doesn't fulfill the first condition because there's a directed path from Z to Y, okay? So that also doesn't work. So in, in, in C and D, I can't do it, but in A, I can do it, okay? Now, what about B? So that's the next question. So B is a bit more subtle. So um, there is no, first of all, there are two Zs. There's Z1 and Z2, yeah? And so there is no directed path from Z1 to Y in this graph where I chop off all the incoming edges of X. And furthermore, one can show that Z2 is a valid adjustment set for this P of Y given to X. So that means in this graph, G, Z1, yeah, then P of Y given to X is identifiable because Z2 is a valid adjustment set. So the second condition is fulfilled. And indeed, one can show that this P of Y given to X can be identified as follows, where I manipulate the Z1 and I need to be able to observe the Z2. And if that's the case, then I have an expression, okay? And um, ideally, now we have a setup, okay, this, the, the graph is coming from a domain expert anyway, and ideally the domain expert can make, set up an experiment where we then observe the P of Z2 and where we furthermore can observe Z1. Yeah. This is all very dry in a way, but it should show you just the power that it's quite um, amazing that in some hairy situations like that, it's possible to do quite a complicated inference. The other thing is, it should also suggest that without drawing a graph and without these kind of um, theorems, it's very hard to argue that such a thing is possible or not, okay? So I think it's still quite cumbersome, and the question is whether the practitioner then will trust this formula, that this is really the case. But um, so if you trust the, the graph and if you trust the mass of Barenboim and Perl, then we can trust this formula as well, okay? Okay, so that was the um, identification through auxiliary experiments. So we, don't can, we can't do experiments directly for what we want to check, but we do some other experiments and then with some clever calculations, we can answer the causal question, okay? In that way, it goes a little bit beyond what we've seen so far. Okay, any questions about this first part? It is quite advanced, I must say, so I'm not expecting that you can do this kind of reasoning during the exam or something. So it ju should just show you more, okay, where is causality now going? My, maybe after the last lecture you think, okay, this is all fine, but now what's, what's next in causality research? And so this is in a way next in causality research, but already done by Barenboim 10 years ago. So, but that was the state that maybe we were at like in the last lecture. So today we see a couple of extensions of what we've seen so far. Okay, let's, question? Ah, okay, so maybe I translate in English for the video. So how precise is, for example, such a calculation in comparison with if I could do the experiment itself? Yeah. Okay, I can only, um, I don't have numbers or I don't know it by heart. I could only also just um, guesstimate. So I guess estimating such densities, there are always mistakes. So you only can approximate these densities. And so then depending on how well you can approximate these numbers, yeah, so your estimate will be precise. So if you can do a very good job and get very good estimates of these numbers, then here's an equation. So then this is really exactly the right answer. So it, it's depending on whether the population you're looking at is large enough and all these questions that you have. So basically the same as you would have if you directly make an experiment for that one. Yeah? There also you have the question, so how noisy is your measurement? So it's kind of the same. But I could imagine that maybe such an experiment might be impossible and this experiment might be simpler and then maybe it's better to have a simple experiment where you can generate more data and get more precise measurements than to have a very bad measurement which is super expensive and maybe doesn't give you a small error or something. So there are these trade-offs. But I guess it depends on the um, application. Yeah. I think the, the main point of this kind of research is to answer questions, so what can be answered at all and what cannot be answered? So always these identifiability results. Yeah. But for practical reasons, I think that's a totally different story. However, my impression is, um, let's say you're a data scientist that you're working together with a practitioner, <coughs> 
if you don't know this causality stuff, yeah, then there might be questions where you say, I don't know it all. But now that you know the causality stuff, possibly you could say, okay, let's try to draw a graph. And then let's see whether we can apply Perl theory here. And then you could suggest maybe some data collection where that is very non-trivial to collect, but um, or that is very non-trivial to come up with. And through the theory, you are able to ask the right questions. Yeah. For example, I could imagine at some book selling companies with websites, they are always asking causal questions. So is causing this advertisement in the bottom right, is it causing that our re re revenue is increasing or something? And then there might be more complicated setups, like um, let's say there's a customer and that raises their account. And what is the probability that we keep that customer given that we do this and that? And I guess there, there could be many situations where you could come up with causal questions and with some things that you can observe. For example, the main motivation of the person you might not be able to observe. Maybe they were un unhappy or they found a better bookseller or whatever, they, they want to support their local store. So some things are unknown and you cannot manipulate and other things you can manipulate. And so you can become very creative. And so formulating experiments then results in designing the website in a particular way and showing some customers that one and another group of customers another one. And then this might answer whether one is the cause of the other. Yeah. So, but it's I don't have a good, a good example for that one, but it's imaginable once you are aware that the, all these things exist, this calculus and all these things, the questions can come in, in practice. Yeah. But not sure. So if you encounter these questions, please tell me. Let's look at the next one, sample selection bias. So there are different types of bias. There's maybe a whole zoo of bias. We look at selection bias now. And that is basically that, suppose that was the example with you are studying the effect of training programs on earnings. Yeah? So you are training people so that they get more new qualifications. And you want to see whether then next year they earn more money in their job or they found a better job or something like that. So you want to find that one out. And there might be the problem that the super duper successful people, they, are, they earn now so much money that they don't bother anymore with these questionnaires that trying to evaluate these training programs or something. They are too busy to attend because they're earning so much money. And so in a way, now the data will be distorted if there's a selection bias that only the people who failed in the training program, so they now answer the questions. And then it's hard to understand. Or maybe then it says, OK, it looks like the training program had a negative effect on the earnings or something. So you might draw the wrong conclusions. And so there's, there's the, your data is basically not clean anymore. And it depends on the value of certain variables whether you observe a data point or not. And this is very, very different from confounding bias, where confounding bias is more about whether a person gets a treatment or not. So this is the one with the, um, I think, the liver example, where we had Simpson's paradox and these kind of things. So depending on large stones and small stones, you make treatment A or treatment B. And so this might influence then the causal inference from x to y as well, because there's a confounding variable. Here it's slightly different. So here you have more of the two variables you're interested in. And there's another variable downstream. And that one decides whether you observe the data or not. And this is called sample selection bias. And it could be drawn like this. So um, up here is, for example, in, in graph A, we have x and y. Yeah. So x might be our training program, and y might be the earnings. And both might influence whether we select the variable or not, or not. And this one gets a double circle. So that's a special variable that is either 1 or 0. If it's 1, we get a data point from x and y. And if s is 0, we don't get it. So our graph is modeling the data generation process, how the data is generated. But the s is telling us whether the data point is popping up in our data matrix or not. OK, so it's like one step ahead. So it's generating the true data. However, we have only access to some subset of this data and can draw our inferences. And then there are different situations. So the selection could depend on x and y. It could only depend on x, for example. Or it could, in a complicated manner, depend on all the other variables. And there might be some that you can observe, and so on and so forth. So again, very complicated different situations that they worked out. So, Again, x is the treatment variable, y is the effect. 
and s is a special variable. If it's zero, then the data is missing. And of course, the s is also, let's say, a Bernoulli random variable with a certain parameter that depends on x and y in this case. Or in that case, the parameter would only depend on x. So it also fits into this graphical model situation. However, it only tells us how the complete data is generated, and then we won't observe everything. So again, our goal is to answer certain query, like p of y given to x. However, now we are only given p of y comma x given s equal to 1. So we are only given part of the full data set. And now the question is, under what, condition can, under what conditions can I, draw, uh, can I have an expression for the q? And by just treating the s now as a random variable, you see already, OK, I can just apply um, the do calculus and fiddle around with it to get expression for what I want. So the question is, under what conditions can we estimate the q from data that was sampled under selection bias, okay? which is the same as saying compute q given only p of y comma x, given that s was equal to 1. OK, so here's a simple case. So the selection might only depend on the treatment. Okay, And now, what would you guess? Can you recover the query or not? Any ideas? So you say, um, so there are two groups of people, and maybe they are all unemployed or something, and um, they get training programs, but they get different training programs. So one getting one, whatever, computer-based, and another one gets one book-based. And now you want, are wondering, so which training program is better? So which one re reaches the higher employment rate? Yeah, And there's a story here is, that the people with the um, computerized version, maybe they get a QR code and they can do it at home. And the other ones, they had their questionnaires, had to fill it out immediately, but there was maybe time pressure or something, or they hand it in. And the people who were in the computerized run, they never did this with the QR code. However, you don't know about the why. So do you think you can still compute the effect or not? You, you think no? Why do you think no? Because they just got it, the, the, the people that were trained on PC. And yeah, OK, let's say that it's only, only, only gone with a certain probability. So it's not all gone. So let's say the people who were trained on the book, they have a, a more likely rate of handing in their questionnaire. And the people trained on computers, some handed it in. OK? Yeah, then probably yes, especially because I ask. OK, no, yes, it can be done. And intuitively, it's about a little bit also now that you look at the graph. So given that I manipulate the x, it's like conditioning on it, kind of, right? And then the s and the y are de-separated. And so this doesn't tell us anything about the y in this case. OK, it can be also derived. So the s and the y are independent given the x. Thus, p of y given x is the same as p of y given x and s equals 1. However, if there's no confounder, yeah, p of y given x is the same as p of y given do x. OK, so in this case, maybe the problem here is that this graph doesn't fit the story with the higher earnings or something, because that would have been the outcome. Or the story would have been, OK, the people who found a job, they are too busy to answer questionnaires afterwards. So maybe my story is not so good for this one here. OK, but so this could be done, for example. So we can calculate p of y given to x by p of y given x, even conditioned under s being equal to 1. But you're right, if I receive 0 from one of the conditions, then I can't answer it. So it depends not only on the graph here, but also on the distributions. So if, let's say, x being equal to computerized training implies that s is equal to 0, in that case, the distributions lead to the effect that I cannot calculate that anymore. But in principle, if the m all probabilities are non-zero, then it's fine. Mm -hmm. OK. So here's the other one, where the treatment and the effect are influenced in the selection, and you can guess already. So here it's not possible. And the s is not really separable from the y. So in that case, we cannot do it. So it's not recoverable by any method, and they can prove it that this is impossible. OK. So this is a more complicated case now. Um, in this case, the w here is, is assumed to be gender, for example. 
And it says it drives treatment and sampling for whatever reasons. So maybe some, so one gender has a different return rate on their questionnaires than the other gender. And also the gender is influencing maybe what treatment was chosen or what training process was chosen or whatever that is. And in that case, it's a bit more complicated. So there are a couple of more variables where I don't have a story for, but let's say there was a domain expert giving us this graph. So what we now have to do, we have to control for two things. So there are these backdoors here, right? So one backdoor is, is going via W2 and Z, and the other one is going via W1, W2, and Z. And we know about backdoors, how to close them, right? We could just observe the Z, for example, or we could observe the W1 and the W2. So there are different ways to close the backdoor. So there are a couple of valid adjustment sets. And now the key is, for the formula with the valid adjustment set, we need a P of the set. So we need the observed distribution of that set. Of that set. Um, however, so we should pick from the valid adjustment set Z set that can be observed even though we have a selection bias. And so now the key is that only the set Z is a valid adjustment set that is independent from the S. <clears throat> and so why is it independent? Because it's deseparated in the graph. So there's no, so there's basically the path from S to Z <coughs> is always going via a V structure. So given nothing, the Z and the S are deseparated. So one path is going W1, W2, and Z. It's blocked because of W, we don't observe it. And the other path going via X, it's blocked at X because we don't observe it. And then there's another path going via Y, and that is also blocked because of Y. So Z and S are deseparated and given nothing, and thus they are independent. So even though we have this sample selection bias, we can get, we can estimate the probability P of Z. And that is useful because then we can now basically just apply the backdoor formula or the adjustment formula and plug everything in. Yeah, where we have now the P of Z is conditioned on nothing else. And this one here, okay, wh what about that one? Yeah, it looks like that is not a problem. Hmm, now I'm a bit confused. Um, ah, okay, so I think this S being equal to one here is not a problem because it's not along any of the paths from X to Y. And it's no descendant of X. And so for that reason, it's okay. So the value of S is not influencing the Y. Yeah, I think here's something missing, but what I need to show additionally is that Y and S are independent given that I observe X and Z. Okay? And that is the case. So they are independent given that I observe X and Z. Yeah, so I think I can also just omit it over here, but we can have a check at the paper. Let's do that. Let's see whether I can find it in the paper. So that is a very, really nice paper. Do calculus, identify, that was the first topic we talked about, auxiliary examples. Those are the graphs we are looking at right now. And um, we are in this section. And now, okay, I copied the formula from them, so that is the correct formula. And they just say that both are estimable from the bias data set. And I guess the reasoning then for the P of Z given S1, as I said, oops, was that the um, Z and the S are independent, so I can omit it. Yeah, it's missing. But the reason being that um, P of Z is equal to P of Z given the other one. So it's really the case that... That is the case because... Um, um, Z is independent of S given nothing. And now for the other expression, I have P of Y given X and Z and S equal to 1. That is the other expression in my formula. And that one is equal to P of Y 
given x and z because, um, again, y is independent of s given that I observe the x and the z. So I'm conditioning on x and z, and then I can get rid of the s equal to 1. Of course, that needs to be checked on the graph. So let's do that. So I need to check that s is independent of y given x and z. So x and z is the, the x over here is observed and the z is observed. So all paths that go via, via the z are blocked by the z. Okay. And the other path going to y is going from s to w1 to x to y. It's blocked because I also observe the x. Okay. So maybe I should um, have some additional equation here where I have condition on s equal to 1 as well. And then I can say, and this is equal to the one without the s equal to 1 because that can be seen from the graph. Okay. That's then very surprising, but I guess this example is constructed in such a manner that it has a couple of valid adjustment sets where only one is useful. All the others cannot be separated. So if you would have chosen w2 and z, then you would have p of w2, z given s1, and there you cannot omit the s equal to 1. So you can only do it for the z. Yeah. This is, by the way, also giving me a nice answer. So why do you bother about finding all valid adjustment sets? But so here you see that sometimes it's important to check all of them since the selection bias might, might um, otherwise you cannot get rid of the selection bias if you don't pick the right one. Now what could this z be? It could be, for example, some variable in the general population, right? The distribution in gender or something or something else. So some that is very unrelated to the query that you are doing here, but which is influencing the outcome of these variables. So far, so good. OK, so that's case C. So this is case D, getting more and more complicated. Um, I find it now super hard to follow all these things. So let's see what they have to say about it in the paper. Again, here the question is, can we find a valid adjustment set yeah, such that p of z is equal to p of z given s equals 1? And the answer is there is no such set. So basically, the z is not the z1 and z2, but Basically, we are again asking x to y. And the question is whether we have a subset of variables which are kind of separate, de-separated from my selection bias. And as it turns out, th these ones, they are kind of all directly connected with the s, yeah, like a downstream task. Also, the t1 has a direct connection kind of to the s. And similarly, to, for the variables on the other side. Yeah, so in this case, the selection, if it, if it also depends on some other variable, w2 over here, then we have a hard time. Now you might wonder, so why so complicated? I think this diagram just covers, it generalizes the previous example by saying, okay, now what if there is some downstream variable of the z, which also influences my selection? Yeah, then this downstream variable got the name w2 and gets a connection down here. And in this case now, we cannot find a valid adjustment set for which we also have this one over here. So there is no such set. So it can be all made more precise, and it could be formulated into a criterion, into a backdoor criterion, which is now called selection backdoor criterion. And um, let's look at this. This is not so easy to understand and so easy to, to digest, I think. So we won't understand it in full detail here, but I just want to show you there is something like that. And the key here is that we are, um, that we, we again need some, some adjustment set, Z, which we need to be able to observe, even though we have a selection bias. So we must be able to observe P of Z. And ideally we are able to observe the bias data of our variables that are here involved. So the one, the z, which we can also observe without bias. And then we have selection bias for the distribution of x, y, and z. And then there are some other conditions which get really technical. So first of all, z is partitioned into non-descendants and descendants of x. Yeah, For whatever reasons, we would have to dig deeper to really understand it. And then the z, z plus must close all backdoors from x to y and there must be a certain independence. But this is getting really quite technical, I think. Yeah. Um, 
and far from easily understandable like, oh, I have a good intuition why this is the right criterion. So this is very far away. I think probably we could spend a whole lecture on this theorem to trying to understand it. And we won't do it today, OK? If we have the selection vector criterion, then, so if Z is S door backdoor admissible, then we also have a nice formula, OK? And so we have our selected data here, our selection bias influence data, and we can um, manipulate it, now adjust it basically with these P of Z, if it's independent of the S equals 1, OK? But this is very technical. <coughs> Nonetheless, it is quite amazing if you have a practical situation in some experiment or in some whatever <clears throat> genetic pathways or something, metabolic pathways or something, where like the, 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 the um, bioinformatics person or the biologist can draw such a diagram and you know that you have a certain selection bias and nonetheless you can prove that you can answer the question that you are interested in. So that's quite amazing if you can do it. Yeah. Or you could also say, no, in the current setup I can't do it, but don't we have access to another variable, maybe above all the other ones with certain arrows? And then the biologist, she could say, okay, yes, yeah, I could give you that data as well. That's like another marker, something. And this marker is influenced like that with the other variables. And that one is for sure not influencing the selection bias. And you can say, okay, great. Then we have our valid adjustment set and we can answer the query, the complicated query. So I think it's quite amazing if, if something like this happens. Good, so far so good. So, of course, we have questions, right? So my question is, why exactly that? So that's like beyond how I try to understand it so far. I just consumed it. And I know there is such a formula if I ever have such a situation. Good, here's yet another one. So um, in this case, the selection depends on some variable which is only connected via some confounding variable with the rest of the structure. Yeah? And um, so this is an example, I think, um, where the first condition is not fulfilled. Yeah? Nonetheless, we can derive an expression. Okay, so this is a particular example that they came up with, which shows that this is not complete. So if you have the selection backdoor criterion and you can fulfill all these rules, then for sure you can use this adjustment formula. However, if you can't find such a set, there might be a way to derive a formula just using the calculus directly. This is similar to the front door criterion, where we also, I think the front door cr criterion is extra. It also has a different form than the valid adjustment sets. So the front door criterion was this thing where you had like from x to some other variable to y, and you were able to control the other variable or control or observe it. And there was no connection from the in-between variable to your confounding variables. And in that situation, we couldn't apply the backdoor criterion, but we could derive an expression from the calculus. And this is like a similar situation, yeah? So far, so good? Okay, so those were the subtleties about um, selection bias. Let's get to the next fancy word. This is called transportability. And as I said, the story is you have measurements in one hospital where there's a certain distribution of patients and you want to transport this information to another hospital where there's a different distribution of patients, okay? And again, we extend our notation here for graphs. So we have now this new variable with this box here, and that is kind of switching distribution. So if S is equal to a certain value, then the Z might have a different distribution. Yeah, for example, S equals one means I'm the popular with older people, so my age distribution is different from another hospital. So in a way, this box variable is also just another random variable. Yeah? I'm not sure it's just marked as a box because it's like switching distributions, right? But that's what discrete random variables are doing anyway if you condition on them. They are switching distributions. So in this case now, we have two populations, pi and pi star, where population here is synonym with two data sets, yeah? or maybe or maybe we only have one data set, but we are interested in another population here. And both have different probability distributions. But both follow this kind of graphical structure. And some things stay the same, and some things change. 
So now the S is the special variable, which are some other factors that create differences, for example, via the age. And now if I condition on S being equal to S star, or S being equal to S, or it could be S being equal to 1, or S being equal to 0, for S being equal to S star, I'm talking about pi star. And if S is equal to 0 or S, then I'm talking about the pi. Now my goal is, again, to calculate something like this. What is the probability that there's a certain effect given a certain treatment, however conditioned, that I observe only in one population? Yeah? So, uh, that, uh, so I want to observe, I want to say something about the population pi star. Um, however, I only have experimental data without the star. Yeah? So again, this is another notation. If I condition on something with the S star, I could also just write P star here, yeah? where the notation is a bit strange because if I would say s equals little s, then I can just omit this condition, right? Because the p is already without the star. So the notation is a bit funny because in, in principle, the p is like all random variables that are there. And one is, for example, this also this random variable s. And depending on the value, yeah, I might get different distributions. And then I change the notation to p star and don't have a condition on S. So that's a bit strange. But I think if I am having, so the, the, including the S being equal to S star, it's kind of switching distributions here. And so now, I, this is the one I want to calculate for my population pi star, so the one hospital. But I only have experimental data from the other hospital. So um, I have experiments from one and observations from the other. Yeah. So I know P star of Y, X, and Z which is basically telling me all the distributions in here for S being equal to S star. And I have interventional data only for one of them. And you see now, this can be also done, of course, with the do calculus. So let's see how to do something like that. So let's flip back. So what was the query? So the query was P of Y given do X, given that I have S being equal to S star. That's my query. So I begin with the sum and product rule. So I put a Z in here, and then I apply the product rule. So there should be one step in between where I say P of Y comma Z given do X and S being equal to S star. So that would have been the sum rule. And then the product rule is splitting the joint distribution of Y and Z into two expressions. Okay, so that is the first step. Then we go on. Um, we first observe that the S is independent of y since I'm now having the z observed. Yeah, So I'm observing the z, and that is kind of blocking my path from y to z to s. Okay, So since s is independent of y given z, for that reason, I can now just omit the s being equal to s star. Now what about these incoming edges of x business thing? So that's coming because I'm having a do x in all these expressions. So I need to look at the manipulated graph where the incoming edges of x are gone. So that is the first step. I can omit the s being equal to s star. Next step, I can omit the do x if I condition on the s equals s star. And that's because x and z are independent of my variable s in the graph where I cut off all the incoming edges of z, uh, of x. Okay. So if that's the case, then I can also just omit the do x. Okay, that's the second step. And finally, okay, I have a distribution of z, given that I'm in the other population, so I can just change the p to a p star. Okay, that's just the definition of the s. Okay, now what do I get? I can now answer the query, which was about y, given that I have do x and s being equal to s star, and I can answer it with observational data from the other population and from observational data on Z in the star population. Okay, now this is called transportability, that I can transport between different distributions. So the main thing here in my head is the, the graph describes the mechanism of something in a hospital, maybe how virus are spreading or whatever, how certain mechanisms are working in the human body or some other things, and they are the same in both hospitals, in a way. 
However, some things change, some initial distribution change, like the distribution of the age. So that depends maybe from one side to the other. However, it's irrelevant for the other mechanisms, for the other edges here. Yeah? And so it's curious that you can learn something about the edges, even though like your querying distributions, like the age distribution is a total different one. But intuitively, it makes sense yeah, that it doesn't matter. OK, so far so good. Here's another graph. So this is one where this circle up here is not measured. So I don't have it. So it's an unknown distribution. And now my z is language skills. Yeah? And that's supposed to be a proxy of age. Proxy means, so I don't have my circle observed here. Yeah? The age, I don't know. But I see how well whatever a child can speak already. I can measure that one. And then this gives me a proxy of the age. Proxy in German, I think, means something like Stellvertreter. Yeah? So it's like a, uh, instead of having the age directly, I have something that is very related to the age. And also in this case now, one can derive that p of y given do x in one distribution is the same <coughs> as p of y given do x in the other distribution. So it looks like in this case, it doesn't matter whether I'm in one or the other distribution. Okay, Yet another case. And here's the third case. So this is the so-called post-treatment variable, a biomarker. I think a biomarker is something that you can then measure. Let's say you, you take some blood, and then you can measure some substance in the blood or something. I think that's a biomarker. And you can measure it after the treatment. Okay. However, again, there might be different distributions. And so you might not exactly measure the biomarkers from that hospital, but only uh, from that hospital you're interested in, but only from another one. But nonetheless, um, you can derive that the probability distribution on the effect of that x has on y can be determined also with having the biomarkers in a different hospital measured, which is kind of weird that this is possible. But it looks like there's a lot of creativity. But now if you are a data scientist, that this would be a super creative solution if you can come up with something like that. Yeah? Or let's say you are in a, a company that is um, selling online shops. Okay, So maybe that's your new company that you are having in 10 years. You are selling online shops to other companies, and they um, outsource this technology. And then you have an online shop over there, another online shop, and a third online shop, and this customer asks a certain question. So does it influence if I do this and that? Then you can say, OK, let's have an experiment. Let's run it on all the other shops. And then measure certain things that I cannot measure in this shop, but I can measure it in the other shops. And then this gives you the answer to a causal question in the third shop, which is quite amazing. Yeah? But of course, you see, it, if you would like to do it, it would require quite a bit of work going through all the math here and getting a precise statement. But there are answers. Um, Curiously, here is also the adjustment formula is slightly different. That's just a node. So typically, the given x is not here. But in this case, it is here, and it must be there. Because the z variable here, the biomarker, must be somehow influenced by my star distribution. Yeah? Because I measured it only in the non-star. I used it only in the non-star distribution, like a forward um, uh, with the um, forward, no, what was it called? The uh, the front door criterion. Uh, so I'm using kind of in the style of the front door criterion here, but that data comes only from the wrong, wrong data set. But I need somehow need to link my star distributions to the Z, and that's why I need to condition here on the X, okay, which is coming from the P star. Okay, so far so good. And yet another one, and this is again an example where you cannot derive anything. So in this case, you just have bad luck. So you cannot derive something for the query. OK, so far so good. So the main point of this is not that we get into the details. And uh, there will be exam question number 17, where I'm asking you, so in this case, can you do it or not, transportability or not? So this should show you more what is possible. Yeah. Any questions about it? Not really. I hope you enjoy it. So next topic is fair machine learning. And that is a topic which is much wider than causality. And there are many approaches from, um, that have nothing to do with causality. But in my impression is the right approach to fair machine learning is to use causality. 
And that's not my invention or something. That's from papers that I read. So I find the fair machine learning papers that use causality, they are the most convincing one, in my opinion. So what is this fair machine learning thing? So there's a nice review paper called Fairness Definition Explained. And they base everything on some data set called German credit data set. So that's from some machine learning repository. So that's basically a data set that asks like stuff from a questionnaire that you might have to fulfill, uh, fill out in a, in a bank. And then at the end, they give you a certain credit score, which means you get the, you get the credit or you don't get it. Okay. And there are different variables in here which might be relevant and which might not be relevant. So for example, the age. I mean, maybe it should make a difference whether I'm 50 or 40 to get a credit, right? However, if I'm five years old, maybe that makes a difference. So there might be some restrictions on it, but in certain intervals, it shouldn't make a restriction. Of course, if my age is 120, maybe the bank also doesn't want to give me a credit, right? Because maybe my promise to pay it back is not so, so valid. But there are certain things that might be discriminating. So it might be discriminating against older people with 60 who say, I want to build a new company or something, I need money, and maybe the bank should give it or because of gender, or because of racial things, or you name it. So there are many things that we would like to exclude from these things, right? In particular, um, you know, in Germany, there's the Buffin, there's like a institute that is checking that the banks are doing everything right, so that everything is good for the customers as well. And unfairness would be something that you really would like to point to and would say, no, this is not possible, this is not allowed, and it's violating some, some law. However, now having machine learning, the bank says, yeah, those are the attributes, and none of them is like looking super suspicious, and I'm just running machine learning and I'm training it with the previous data from the, how, what, whether people paid the credit back or not. So this is a totally valid statement to do that. But there might be a bias in as well, so there might be also some bias already in the data, right? That maybe in the past, m many males were taking credits, and now women also founding companies more likely than maybe 50 years ago, but the data just doesn't show it. And so there might be some discrimination against that one. Anyway, so the goal here is given such a data set, we want to infer the credit score and then decide whether we give it credit, but we want to be fair. So other attributes that should be ignored. And there are some hidden attributes as well. For example, telephone number. So that's a curious one because maybe from the telephone number, you can infer whether a person comes from a wealthy area of the city or from a bad area of the city. Okay, and maybe only the, the last digit of your five first digits from your telephone number tell you from what area in Dortmund you're coming. And maybe you can then discriminate people because of their whatever economic social status. You can, of course, ask for the economic social status, but then only directly by asking for credit history or something. Okay, anyway, so it could be quite complicated. So now following the notation of Verma, Let's say some of the attributes or variables are protected. And protected means they should not be used for credit assignment. So in this case, it would be number 16, gender. And then there are the additional attributes. Let's call them X. And then there's the classification result, whether we give the credit or not. Yeah? So that is variable Y. And then there's the so-called predicted probability S. So that's yet another number. And I hope we can remember all these letters, so now there will come a lot, lot of slides that just use these numbers, but we will flip back from time to time to remind us. So the S is not a random variable, but that is the probability of whatever, getting the credit, given that I've seen all the other variables in this case. And then there's also the predicted decision in this case. So the, um, whether I'm, whether for example my probability is above a threshold or not, something like that. Okay, now there are different measures of fairness that are discussed in this paper, and they are in three groups, statistical measures, similarity measures, and causal reasoning. And I think the causal reasoning one is the, that's the one we should use, I think, but that's just my opinion. But let's look through the other ones as well and get like an intuitive understanding how they are made. We won't go into too much detail, but you should just get a feeling what's out there. So let's first look at the statistical measure. So here's some more notions that we need. We need these motions of true positive, true negative, false positive, false negative. I hope you're familiar with those ones, right? So the true positive are the ones, a point that is classified positive and it is really a true point. 
and then there are all the other combinations. And they are typically abbreviated like that. There are many more. There are the PPV, the TPR, the FDR, and so on. And they are basically can be calculated from the TP, FP, FN, and TN score. And there's also the precision and the recall. So there are these kind of words that are somewhere in this table, okay? We don't have to worry too much about all these things, but these now can be used to define different statistical measures of fairness. So here's the first one, the group fairness. So let's first read maybe the intuitive meaning of it. So we should have equal opportunity to obtain a good credit score. So here's my protected attribute, the gender. So the probability of getting this decision one, given that I'm a male, yeah, should be the same as the probability that I'm a, a woman. And that sounds right, right? That might be okay. However, none of these criteria is ideal. So here's a story where this is not so ideal. So let's say um, male who look for a credit, maybe they um, are typically successful companies, right? And it's maybe related that they are males because they are already longer in the business. And so it's much, there are much more applications from credit assignments for male, which are very good than for women. Okay, and now it could mean basically that for that reason, like the rate for women is lower than for men, but it has nothing to do that the gender is basically um, giving them less credibility, yeah, so to get a credit, but it's just that history produces a situation where more successful companies are led by men than by women. And by women, the companies are, for whatever reasons, not so successful than for men. Or maybe they're in different businesses or whatever, right? Maybe one are in the medical industry and the other one are in engineering or something. And it could be that maybe economy makes engineering applications super bad, but medical applications super good. And then, of course, as a bank, it could be stupid to do it like that, right? Because then I also have to give some bad companies money. Yeah. So group fairness sounds good, but of course you can construct also where this is not so good. Now there's the conditional statistical parity, which is almost the same, but now it's slightly different. So have equal opportunity to obtain a good credit score in groups that are defined by some allowed variable. So what would be an allowed variable? For example, for whether the company is coming from a market that is of coming from the engineering market. So I could say L being equal to engineering, that should be the same, nonetheless, whether the, the boss is a male or the boss is a female, okay? And this is now kind of getting rid of the problem of group fairness yeah, by additional having additional variable. But there are also stories that kind of destroy that one, or not destroy, but where this thing is not working very well. So there are many more, so let's go through them <coughs> more quickly. Then we could also ask that the fraction of correct positive predictions should be the same for both genders. Okay, interesting. So we, we want to say that, um, let's go back, the, the true positives is the, the, the blah, blah, blah. Let's go, go back to the definitions. Yeah, predictive. I'm a bit confused by that one now because now they say the D is the true value, right? But let's keep it like that. So maybe I copied it wrongly from the slide. So the idea is that I now pick from this table, I pick one of the groups out here, and I'm saying for those ones that are in this group, I want that everything is the same. Now you could imagine I could pick all the other groups out as well, and those give different criteria. So there's predictive parity, then there's also predictive equality, which is yet another one where I say, I want to have similar results for applicants of both gender with actually negative credit scores. So basically, the one could be positive thing, and here the Y is following the D, and here it's the other way around, and I'm talking about negative ones. So, so for me, these things are a bit confusing. So I think we also would have to go much deeper to really understand these things in detail. And then there's another one, equal opportunity, yet another variation. It looks very much like the one up here, but somehow we swapped the role of Y and D. So I want similar results for applicants of both genders which actually positive credit scores. Hmm, okay. Fine. So that's yet another variation. And then there's combinations of the previous ones. 
And there's another one and another one, which we won't go into detail. I mean, I must admit, we also didn't go into detail. I just want to show you there are these different ways to define it. And typically for each way you define it, you can come up with a story where it doesn't sound right. And you can up with, come up with stories where it sounds right. So it's quite complicated. Also, sometimes they are violating each other. So one might be true, then another one gets wrong, or the other way around. Okay. Um, there are more. There's test fairness. What is that one? Um, same, okay, this is about... So the probability of success should be the same, okay, for each score. So this was... There are the variables that you observe, and from those ones you are calculating a score with machine learning, and some of the distribution for... Given that you have a particular score, you should get the same thing. Yeah, so basically you are calculating a score from your variables that you ask in the test, and then for the same score, you want to have the same outcome. And then there's the thing of well calibration. So that basically means that the probability of deciding y equals 1 should be equal to s. So that's the calibration. That's typically something when you have a value inside the probability, and that also appears outside. Okay. Whatever, it just means that the score really means the probability. And you can also formulate something like this with expectations which basically means, on average, there should be a certain equality, okay? And then you can also do it for the positive class, or you can ask for something for the negative class. And some of these things are mutually exclusive, so possibly you cannot have both. So you might get a balance for the positive class, but then this leads to an imbalance for the negative class. And maybe in some situations you want to have it the other way around. So it's a big mess, in my opinion. Um, so there's also a problem with these statistical approaches. Ah, oh, yeah, it could happen that, for example, let's say these probabilities, let's pick one of them. Um, let's say equal opportunity, yeah? Let's pick that one. So that is a statement that says that two probabilities should be the same. So we could do the following. We could, for the female, we follow our algorithm and we take our machine learning and it does some score prediction mumbo jumbo and then we do our prediction and we find out, okay, the probability of getting a good score for women yeah, is um, equal to whatever, 0.6. Then for the male applicants, we are not looking at the sophisticated machine learning. We're not even looking at the questionnaires. We just flip a coin with 0 0.6. And then some of these criteria are fulfilled. Maybe not that one, but for example, that one at the, at the beginning. So that one would be fulfilled. So we have a sophisticated method and determine the probability that female get the credit, maybe 0 0.6. And we do that by really sorting the applicants with our algorithm. And the top half gets it, the bottom half not. But then for the male, we just flip a coin and reach exactly the same probability of success without looking at the questionnaires. And there you see that some of these approaches are limited. Yeah, they are not ensuring that we really look at the data at all, right? They're not ensuring it. Some do better than others, so the more stuff you put into these conditions, like the more you are taking it into account, but not, so they are all not perfect. However, those are problems with statistical measures of fairness that somehow, um, yeah, you, you can create weird solutions which also fulfill them, which are obviously kind of garbage, okay? Um, there's also the so-called causal discrimination, and this is now a so-called similarity-based measure. And it is causal discrimination, but I think it, this is, has not yet something to do with causality. So that basically says that if everything is the same, so the x are all variables, so if I have a female and a male, and basically all entries in the questionnaires are the same, but only the gender one is deferring, yeah? in that case, I must have the same outcome at the end. Okay, and that would be a cr criterion which is also very reasonable that you could check, right? And then maybe the telephone number, maybe there's an area in Dortmund where there are living more males and another area where there are living more females. So that couldn't have been taken into account if at the end, basically having everything equal, we get the same outcome, okay? Then there's the thing, fairness through unawareness. That's also a critical thing. So that's just saying, okay, if the numbers on my questionnaire are all the same, I'm just ignoring the gender variable, okay? And that's also a possibility. But of course, it also has problems because the protected attributes 
might appear in other attributes as well. So there's no guarantee that this works. So there might be a proxy attribute which tells us something about the protected data. And then there's uh, fairness through awareness. It's the other way around. So here we say basically similar individuals should have similar distribution. So basically it says that if I'm kind of having similar questionnaires then I want to have a similar outcome. But somehow this is measuring it differently where I'm now, I, I forgot what the M is in this case. But so that is yet another criterion. Okay, what am I telling you here? Basically, there are 16 or even more notions how to define fairness, and they all are kind of optimizing a certain thing. And now we could imagine if I have a, a support vector machine and training a classifier, that I could add something like that as a regularization. Yeah? So I could <coughs> ask, please classifier, do the best that you can try to minimize the empirical risk, but at the same time ensure that you are well calibrated. Yeah. Or at the same time ensure that predictive equality is fulfilled. Yeah. So one can imagine that this is something that, that can be done. And it is reasonably to do, and sometimes it might be the right thing, right thing. However, I think there are better ways, and the better ways are the causal, the causal reasoning approaches to fairness. And I like those the most. However, for those, you have to have a causal graph. So you need to have really a causal graph of your variables. And when you have the causal graph of the variables, then you say, OK, let's say there's a variable g, like gender, that I don't want to use, that is protected. And then I can say for every path whether I'm using it or not. So for example, for this path from gender to employment length to the decision, Maybe that's a path I don't want to use because the employment, le employment length is like a proxy variable which is directly related to gender and I don't want to discriminate against this gender variable. However, there's another one. The gender might also influence the credit amount that I'm asking for, okay? And that should not influence my decision, okay? So of course, oh, no, the other way around. So the employment length should not influence my decision but the credit amount kind of is something that is reasonable to ask whether I want to give the credit or not. And even though from the credit amount I can determine the gender, yeah, that's a reasonable question to ask whether they're asking for one million or for one billion yeah, to buy Twitter or some other things. Yeah? So there's different types of variables in my causal graph. And then there might be one that is totally unrelated to my gender, which might be the credit history. And so what these approaches in causal reasoning are doing, they are first of all defining a proxy variable. So that is a descendant of a protected variable, yeah, which can be used to derive something about the gender. And I think in this example, the employment length and the credit amount are both proxy variables, okay, because they tell us something about the gender, whereas the credit history is not. And then there's the so-called resolving variables, and that is a descendant yeah, of a protected attribute, in this case, a credit amount, which we accept as non-discriminatory. So we would say, of course, the bank must look at the credit amount. That's a variable that must be taken into account. It wouldn't make sense not to take it into account, even though it tells us something about a protected variable. And so now with this vocabulary now here, we could much more precisely say, what variables are we allowed to use and what variables are we not allowed to use? So we could have the questionnaire from the beginning and we draw a big causal graph with some sociologists or something. And then we could say, these variables can go into my support vector machines and these variables are not allowed to go into the support vector machine. And then I think we can achieve fairness. However, of course, this is a little bit wishful thinking, right? Because typically we don't have this big causal graph. And so we have to go to simpler solution. But ultimately, I think the fairness problem is very much related to causality problem. So also for um, causal reasoning, there are also different criteria. One is called counterfactual fairness. I think there's a paper. I think I mentioned it on the very beginning. Let's check. Yeah, so there's this um, paper from Niki Kilberto's Avoiding Discriminating by Causal Reasoning. I think that's a nice paper which discusses different approaches how to use causal reasoning for fair machine learning. So that's quite interesting stuff. And so the story is very short. So there's no directed path from 
my protected variable to my decision. So that's counterfactual fairness, and that is very strict. In that case, um, I also not allowed to use the credit amount, and I'm not allowed to use employment length. I can only use the credit history if I want to achieve counterfactual fairness, how they define it. Then there's a smaller one where they say there shouldn't be any unresolved discrimination. So all the paths from my variable g to d must be resolved. We are resolving variables. So I'm allowed to use credit amount. I'm not allowed to use employment length. Okay. And that sounds to me like a very good compromise. And then there's another one, no proxy discrimination. So that says that there's no directed pass from G to D via proxies. And that is more restrictive than 18. That was my note. However, I'm a bit unclear how it compares to 17, whether it's the same or not. But um, yeah, I, I would have to look it up. Anyway, my main point of this slide is um, fairness in machine learning is a big topic, also one that is like growing. I think we also get some new professors that are experts in these areas, which su should be super interesting. So there might be also a, um, a machine learning lecture, particular design, talking about fairness. Um, there are different approaches, and it's an interesting research topic. How could we design an algorithm in machine learning that automatically is fair? So that would be really nice. I don't know whether this is really possible, so we should ask the experts. And my impression is that like a causal approach, if we have this knowledge of a graph, is the ideal way of doing things. So that would be the best. But yeah, in causality, sometimes it's a bit, it's the ideal world, but we cannot do it because we don't have the graph. So. Yeah, it's, it's not the ideal solution in practice often. So sometimes in practice, we need to do something else. Anyway, I think that's it. Oh, there's a final one, classify, yes. As we know, we can also measure the strengths along individual paths and then talk about the different paths, whether we want to take it into account or not. So that would be like an even more fine-grained way to design things. Anyway, so that's it. That's the end of today. And it's also the end of the causality lecture. So next week, what we are going to do is I give a little overview of our, all the topics. And let's see whether you are there. If no one here, I won't give the lecture. But if you are here, then I will give you a quick overview of all the topics that we covered, which might be interesting to see as well. OK. So thanks for your attention. And see you next week. <laughs>